The oil crisis here at home is fueling calls that maybe it's time we nationalize the industry. But what would the process of acquiring oil production from private companies look like? From implementing imminent domain, reigning in fuel industry greed, and complying with climate success, there's a lot to unpack here. Joining us now to drill down, so to speak, <laughs> on the renewed calls for nationalizing fuel is Brianna Joy Gray, co-host of the Bad Faith podcast and former Bernie Sanders press secretary. Brianna, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Robbie. All right, so have at it. What is the case for nationalizing the oil industry? So my first inclination to do this episode was last year when I remember reading articles that pointed out that for the same price that uh, the country was bailing out the airline industry, it could just buy the airline industry. And it made me think about all of these instances historically in this country where there have been bailouts, bankruptcies, and the like, in which the state has come into control of these companies, most notably uh, General Motors in 2008, and then quietly just return them over to the companies without really doing what a normal acquisition would do, which is to try to return benefit from the owner, in this case, the American people. So I brought two experts on, including uh, Johanna Bozwa, who's written an extensive paper on all the different methods that one could go about doing this. And what's so fascinating to me in this process, learning more about it, is the extent to which our kind of common American conception of nationalization as this kind of kooky, despotic thing that help, happens elsewhere in the world is far from the truth, not, because, not just because we have so many models for it here in America, but because it's basically the same act acquisition model that corporate mergers and everybody else does all the time. It's just the government that's buying up majority shares, if not all of the company, and then doing uh, basically implementing policies that are in the public benefit instead of for corporate profit. So I'm behind on my podcast, and I, but I do want to get to this episode because I'm curious about the mechanics. But give us a short version of what it would look like to nationalize kind of an international industry. These are multinational companies. You know, how do we prevent them from saying, okay, ni nice job, you, you, like, you, you nationalized our U.S. version, which includes these four employees. Congratulations. The, our, our, we're, actually, <laughs> we're actually registered in Ireland, so you didn't nationalize the rest of it or, what, or yeah, wherever. So, yeah. so my understanding is that at the end of the day, these companies are uh, controlled by their boards, regardless, right? And so the point of the issue would be to control for, the for America to buy, for the country to buy a majority stake, if not the totality of the of of the um, share ownership so that it had control over the voting rights and the activities of the country as a whole. So it wouldn't be different again from any other circumstance. And by doing so, it would be able to do things like have a wind down, if we're talking about the oil industry, where you're able to ensure a just transition for workers so that workers wouldn't bear the brunt of winding down from dirty, the dirty energy policies that are killing our planet and causing so many health effects across the board. Uh, it would be uh, the corporate profits that take a hit because no longer would the priority be making sure that there is a profit, but we making sure that the the people were taken care of. Notably, there is a historical example of this, right? The reason we're talking about this is so often when we're dealing with purely profit-driven incentives, we don't have the kind of resources distributed to communities when a company decides that there's not going to be sufficient pro uh, profit for the top. So most notably and um, most kind of gloriously in the public imagination is the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was a part of the country in the early middle part of the century that simply wasn't being served by the electric uh, by the private power industry. That no one wanted to go there. It was considered to be too too rural, too poor. It just wasn't the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. And so we had a state-run energy facility, which not only was incredibly effective in delivering power to millions of underserved Americans, it actually turned a profit and continues to turn a profit to this day. And the argument that's being made on the show was that by heralding these examples, pointing to other examples like the ownership of GM in 2008, we can start to make Americans more aware of the fact that in countries all over the world, they have a lot of success from having at least partial ownership of various industries. For example, in sort of several Scandinavian countries that Matt Brunig pointed to, the other guest on my show from the People Policy Project, um, there is majority ownership in those kind of extremely resource-rich industries in those resource-rich countries that nurse the benefit of the populations there. Mm. Yeah, and not to interrupt you, but yes, the, in 1964, Barry Goldwater, as I'm sure you know, he was undone by his attacks on the Tennessee Valley Authority. Like that a communist right. plot. Yes, his, <laughs> Robbie's hero, Barry Goldwater, uh, he, he took the sword to that windmill, the TVA windmill, and the, the windmill won. 
and it, it heavily contributed to him getting annihilated. And in Alaska, the, the, the permanent fund there is extremely popular as well. What do you think, Rob? You sold? <laughs> far, six, far from six, it, yeah. I have to say. I'm very nervous about the government running industries. I don't know that our government or any government, but especially our government, if, if the clowns is in Saudi very Arabia competent. Can, if Saudi Arabia can run an oil company, I think we could pull it off. What do you I'm think? I'm not sure we could pull it off. I'm, well, Robbie, I mean, Robbie's making an interesting point here. You know, I think that people who have some skepticism of the government because of some demonstrated inefficiencies aren't wrong to point that out. And I think that liberals and leftists need to be honest about the reality. But that reality was caused by years of Republicans very intentionally taking a hatchet to the um, internal mechanisms of state, defunding programs, cutting down on staff, and making it difficult for the government to do anything internal so that it has to externalize and and, and basically send all of our tax dollars out to government contracts to people who also don't always do the best job, right? I've talked to colleagues here in DC who are very frustrated running their departments even within the Biden administration because there's just not very much uh, grist internally for them to work with. So we do have to go about also rehabilitating our government's ability to do things at the same time that we pursue some of these kinds of programs. But the relying on the planned obsolescence that Republicans to put, have put in place isn't an excuse, nor is ignoring all of the inefficiencies and the problems that come from private industry all the time. Conservatives like to say this thing sometimes, which is that, you know, democracy isn't the best system, but it's better than all the other systems or something to that effect. Well, I would say the same thing for private industry. Certainly there are legitimate criticisms to be made of the way the government can operate, but unlike private industry, it is ostensibly accountable through democratic means. And has as its sole purpose, its sole stated purpose, delivering for the people in a way that private industry absolutely does not have. As well, right. Seems. Private industry is trying to make profits. I agree. But the profit incentive can be, it doesn't, right, it doesn't serve all our interests. It doesn't necessarily do anything about inequality or other social problems we want to correct. But it does, does create wealth that can be then be put to good use. It creates greater efficiencies absent the profit motivation. I mean, look, the airline industry actually is, is one of the more frightening, I think, examples against the kind of thing um, you're talking. I mean, already the influence of government on the airline industry has made it miserable, has made it more miserable to fly over the past several decades. Like if they if they ran the whole thing and, and, and deregulating the airline industry, right, was a, actually a huge innovation that took place under Jimmy Carter that made like flight better and accessible to more people uh, for the first time ever. And now we've, we've undone a lot of that by having just utterly ridiculous farcical government regulation over uh, air travel that I, I, I wouldn't I, now I wouldn't bail them out either and uh, you know a lot if you're saying that well why are we bail if we bail them out shouldn't the government just run it well they shouldn't bail them out would be my answer to a lot of these things especially GM let them go broke I don't care about them is it, this is, this the is argument why, this is why I cannot be elected governor yes. of Michigan or president <laughs> but oh well Look, there already is a lot of corporate welfare. This is the argument that people like Bernie Sanders yeah, make. Yeah, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And, it. and in any other instance, if there was going to be a bailout like this, if another corporation were going to acquire a different corporation with the idea of saving it, there would be an expectation that there would be benefits for corporation, the savior corporation's shareholders. The shareholders that exist in the form of the American people, when we use our tax taxpayer dollars to bail out these industries, there's never any expectation of a return on the investment. So this is a conversation about how to go about getting that. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Right, Brianna, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. And we'll have more rising right after this.